On contrary to my last video, I want to do a nice, relaxed video detailing the history of 1066. It's only relevant because I like history, and I'm British. I hope you enjoy! Why is it that the English language is a hybrid of French, Latin, Germanic, and other languages? Why is it that, throughout history, the English and the French warred with each other so much? Why is it that Robin Hood stole from the rich and gave to the poor? All of these questions have something to do with English culture, but they also have one more thing in common. They are the result of the conquest of England, as it is called by historians. The Middle Ages were a time of learning, worshipping, and kingdom building. Around the 9th and 10th centuries, European powers, as we know them today, slowly began to emerge, often in small, unorganised towns and villages, becoming stronger as their ambitious rulers expanded their territories and claimed new land through wars. Before the 11th century, England and France were hardly recognisable. It was only until the Norman conquest of England that not only the English, but the French too, managed to become independent powers with their own customs and traditions. Before jumping straight into the Norman conquest, it is important that we first look at the state of the world at the time. Around the fall of the Roman Empire, to the blooming of the Middle Ages, what was England, and how did it come to be? An isolated island with nice, fertile land, England was originally inhabited by the Britons, who were also known as the Celts, who were attacked and defeated in the early 1st century by the Roman Empire. The Romans had an extensive empire, and they were constantly on the lookout for new land to conquer. England was just off the coast of France, which had previously been occupied by the Gauls, another sect of the Celts, whom Caesar famously waged war. After several expeditions, England was conquered, named Britannia, and settled. At its heart was the city of Londinium, later to become London, the capital of England. All was fine at this point, that is, until the 476 AD, when a series of barbarian attacks carried out by the various Germanic groups in Europe brought down the glorious Roman civilization. Putting an end to its over a millennium old history, decentralizing Europe, resulting in the fragmentation of the empire into different kingdoms, each of which was ruled by a German tribe, such as the Franks in France. A group of these German tribes, the Angles, Saxons, and less importantly, the Jutes, came to Britannia to create their own kingdom between 400 and 600 AD. The Angles and the Saxons, or collectively Anglo-Saxons, colonized the island. Westerners referred to this as Angleland, which you might guess. This is where we get the name England. The realms of Angleland were named after the Saxons. From them, we get Sussex, Wessex, and Essex, thought to be the combination of the Saxon and the cardinal direction from which it was derived. In other words, Sussex to be South Saxon, Wessex to be West Saxon, and likewise for Essex. Over the course of the next few centuries, these realms were formed and moulded into independent kingdoms, or such ones as Sussex, Essex, and Kent existed, they did not play such a big role. Instead, the four most important kingdoms at the time, which shaped much of politics, were Northumbria, Wessex, East Anglia, and Mercia. Given this general background, we can now look at the more immediate events leading up to the conquest. Edward the Confessor was the King of England before the conquest. Raised in Normandy as a child, taught to speak French, he came to the crown more loyal to the place of his rearing than his birthplace. Upon ascending to the throne, Edwin favoured the Normans over the English. He imposed Norman traditions on the English, he appointed to the most important and prestigious religious and political positions to the Norman nobles. He favoured his Norman subjects more than his English ones, and he opted to build with the Norman style, constructing the illustrious Westminster Abbey in 1055. With many vaulted arches and spires, of course, none of the English like this. They despised their king, despite being English in blood and in name, he was truly a Norman at the core. This man was not fit to be the King of England, no. He was a foreigner with a crown. In the eyes of the Anglo-Saxons, this led to bitterness among the nobles. One such man was Godwin, the Earl of Wessex, the most powerful man in all of England, even more powerful than the king himself, for he was a crafty leader and had strong allies. His daughter married King Edward, his son married into the Kingdom of Flanders, and his nephew happened to be the King of Denmark. As such, Godwin was not a man to be trifled with. 
principled, prideful and consensuous, he opposed Edward's Norman reforms and actively protested them. With his power, he was able to alter the political climate of England, as if it were a game of chess, carefully navigating his pieces around, influencing the nobles, casting doubt on the king's decisions, acting as an advisor to the king or trying to dissuade him from causing any more damage. One day, however, a scuffle went down between an Englishman under Godwin's rule and a Norman who was a friend of King Edward. Godwin was forced into a tough position, pressured by the king to carry out a fitting punishment for his subject for starting the brawl and killing the Norman. This Godwin refused to do. No longer would he put the Normans before the English, his countrymen, his brothers. So he was exiled, along with his son, Harold Godwinson, who shared in his father's resentment. The king dealt with the problem himself, to the gain of his noble friends, which angered the English nobility. Now, at this point, the Normans having gained more land and more money, the English nobles sent for Godwin, promising their armies and their allegiances to him, asking that he'd come back, dispose of the falsely English king, and restore greatness to England. So, raising an army, Godwin and his son returned to England while under exile, joined now by the armies of the nobles, so that they had a substantial force, with which they ravaged much of northern England, tearing apart villages, soundly defeating the king's forces. Edward conceded to his loss and gave Godwin back his earldom over Wessex. Shortly after that, though, Godwin died, his son, Harold, became Earl of Wessex, and his other son, Tostig Godwinson, became Earl of Northumbria. Such were the immediate circumstances of England prior to the Norman Conquest. Now we must ask, who were the Normans, and what business did they have invading England? The Normans were a collective of different Germanic tribes who lived in the Nordic countries, or Scandinavia, which consists of Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. These days, we would refer to them, informally and loosely, as Vikings. Indeed, those rugged, violent barbaric seafarers and the warriors who raided the coast in their small manoeuvrable ships. Now, it would be naive to say the Normans were French, because that is not the case. The Normans were not French, but we have said Nordic. How is that then? That Normandy, land of the Normans, was located in France. And why is it that we associate the Normans with France? Simply, the Normans being Viking. Simply, the Normans being Vikings raided the French coast, and to stop these raids, the Franks gave them the land to keep. Land that would end up becoming Normandy, located in northern France, right below England. And not only did the Normans own land in France, but they also adopted the French language. For this reason, also, we associate the two cultures, though separate, they were practically indivisible, to the extent that the Normans borrowed their culture from the French. Another wrong assumption is that the Normans and the English were total opposites, the Normans being warlike and uncivil, and the English peaceful and civil. In fact, Normandy and England were very similar in terms of their cultures. It was only until the introduction of Christianity to England that the two drifted in separate directions. But our cultural stereotypes are not wholly wrong either, as the Normans and the Vikings were notorious for their raids on England from the mid to late 1800s or the 9th century. Their victims usually rich Christian monasteries. The main star of Normandy, to whom we must give our attention to, is a man named William. Duke of Normandy. Born the illegitimate son of Robert I of Normandy, William was given the epithet the Bastard. Robert left the throne abruptly, leaving his son to lead the kingdom at a very young age seven. When he thought unfit by most, as a result, the Normans did not initially like William, calling him by his then known title William the Bastard. Like many other successful rulers, William earned his right to keep the crown. He proved to be as strong, firm, and inflexible. His iron will impressed the people, and he came to be respected by them. William, Duke of Normandy, emerged triumphant amidst the chaos that was Normandy, and with this newly earned respect and power, he would do great things. Yet, another misconception is that, because England and France had so many feuds, they must always have hated each other from the beginning. Rather, Normandy and England had always been on good terms, notwithstanding the raids from the north, their leaders often intermarried, and both countries had safe havens for each other, as fate would have it. These good tides, blessings we say, might actually have been the curses in disguise. 
it was their good relationship with which would fate them to one of their greatest conquests in European history. In 1066, Edward died. Having had no children, Edward nominated Harold, surprisingly considering Harold fought against him, on January 6, the Witten. An early assembly that functioned like Parliament elected Harold King of England. William heard of this and was outraged because he had been betrayed. In 1051, William said, Edward himself promised that William the latter would get the throne after him, and on to that, William was Edward's first cousin, once removed, whereas Harold was not related to Edward whatsoever. To William, it was clear that he was the rightful king. Secondly, two years earlier, in 1064, Harold's ship was wrecked in Normandy, and he, seeking safety, went to William, to whom he swore his allegiance, saying he would serve under him. Even though Harold confirmed this story, neither Edward nor Harold's words were valid. The Witten declared, since they had not been present when it was made, seeing that there were no other witnesses, neither really happened. So Harold was the king, not William. Determined to get the crown, William knew he had to take it by force, and did so with the support of the Pope. As it is currently late, I will continue this story in the next video. I thoroughly enjoyed this storytelling, and I hope the next part will be much longer. Thank you so much, and I'll see you next time.